Hi and welcome to another Monthly Buzz, our digest of EV news, sustainable technology and stories from around these adjacent spaces. So the more observant among you will have noticed that February did not have one of these TMB episodes. So uh, yes, we are wrapping the uh, February and March news all together here. Well, without further ado, let's get into the next Monthly Buzz. So as I say, apologies for missing out on February there. It's been a pretty hectic month, as you can see from the flow of videos slowing down a little bit. But let's dive straight into the news. Um, and one of the earlier stories in February was the uh, announcement that Toyota would finally bring EVs back to the USA. After, uh, well, a good seven years or so now since the RAV4 EV Pure electric vehicle was sold. Uh, they will have two new models, pure electric models, on sale by next year. Apparently, 2022 is when these are uh, slated for. Obviously, you have Toyota with a uh, pretty rich history in uh, green vehicles, if not electric vehicles. Um, we've mentioned the RAV4 EV, which was, you know, a cult little vehicle, but uh, nothing has followed it since then. Toyota, as with uh, a lot of Japanese manufacturers, has been invested in uh, hybrid technology, uh, to an extent hydrogen as well, and um, not necessarily that much of a strong backer in electric vehicles. And even in the um, announcement for these two new uh, EVs where the diesels were pretty scant they made pretty clear that you know this isn't where they're putting all their eggs in this basket they're talking about a certain percentage of their vehicles being electrified by uh, 2025 and then another um, section in 2030 and you've got to watch out whenever automakers trying to wean away the combustion engines but you've always got to look for that term electrified because that's going to be uh, anything from a just mild hybrid vehicle all the way up through your plug-in hybrids and your pure electrics so there's always a caveat there it gives them a lot of wiggle room to introduce you know cars that do start to cut down emissions but maybe do not go all the way towards electric uh, vehicle. Again, this is uh, progress of a kind. We want to see Toyota and these major, major manufacturers start to move towards electrification. Obviously, we can see Volkswagen really starting to, you know, hit its stride with the uh, ID4 here in the US and uh, both that and the ID3 in Europe. And sticking with the electrification plans of various automakers, we have uh, Kia, who not only announced the EV6, a very sleek looking um, counterpart to the Hyundai Ioniq 5, which will be built on the same EGMP platform. Uh, Kia has announced its uh, Plan S, which is for electric vehicles over the next uh, four or five years through to 2026, and uh, looking at selling 500,000 pure electric vehicles and uh, up to 1 million eco-friendly vehicles so again we get that you know getting into electrification or electrified rather than pure electric as a progression for kia and uh, the kia hyundai group as a, a wider entity to get towards this goal so you see these two on 2025 2026 you know automakers trying to put out their five-year plans represents a 25 million dollar investment for kia and it's right in line with the likes of GM, Volkswagen, and everyone has this kind of somewhere between 10 and 30 billion dollars going towards their new EV platforms, their battery technology, uh, factories, all kinds of things that uh, will move them towards electric vehicles, whether it's, you know, the Toyota um, side of electrification, electrified, or uh, the more GM, Volkswagen angle of trying to phase out combustion engines completely. Which also brings us to Audi, who have done the same. They will stop working on uh, combustion engine technology. Um, and it's just part of this wider, you know, Volvo has made similar uh, proclamations about electrified vehicles. You can see every automaker trying to tread this um, tightrope of still selling combustion vehicles because that's where their bread and butter is right now and they can't just give up profits to getting to a path where they can blend in electric vehicle sales have some electrified have some pure electric and as they see which ones take off they can put more money in that uh, direction and start to uh, move more towards 
the all-electric future that we know will now happen. And on slightly less uh, optimistic news, uh, in February we had a judgment come down uh, on the LG Chem and SK Innovation battery dispute. Uh, that was a legal decision in favour of LG Chem, uh, stating along the lines that uh, SKI had uh, taken technology that was not theirs to take. Um, without getting into the, the legal nitty gritty of it, uh, it is being challenged, so we'll have to see what happens. But it comes at a bad time as we try to look at uh, getting increased battery supply. You see, you know, manufacturers like GM uh, starting to look at making their own battery tech in partnership with LG Chem uh, here in the States. You have uh, obviously Tesla with a full on battery plan for the next 10 years to really ramp up its production and get into more models, bring battery costs down. So anything that constrains supply or uh, has an impact on how much uh, can be produced is uh, not good. There's uh, speculation that the current administration in the US will intervene to try and help uh, you know, ease that um, legal dispute between LG Chem and SKI. I'll put some links down in the description so you can do more reading on this if you like. Highlights how important uh, not just the models are, but the battery production uh, facilities. Getting those into the, uh, the US as much as possible, making that supply chain more localized, um, and having access to the, uh, all the pieces that make up this uh, EV puzzle. And sticking with uh, batteries, obviously it may be a while to uh, cast your mind back, but uh, in February we had some pretty severe weather in terms of uh, freezing weather down in Texas, which is quite the change compared to what we saw when we were down there in Austin uh, the year prior. Um, this was freezing temperatures uh, that kind of seized up every aspect of um, energy generation down in Texas from uh, you know wind turbines freezing, which was something that certainly caught the eye of uh, some news outlets but it wasn't just the renewables in fact wind is not the major source of power down there despite what some uh, some reports would have you believe every aspect of uh, the energy production pretty much failed its uh, use case due to not being winterized not being used to having that low temperatures but it did raise the case for a couple of technologies that um, you know make it into EVs and may start to become more prominent over the next couple of years. Um, firstly, we saw uh, the EcoBoost Ford F-150s, which have uh, a new generator facility on some of the trim levels being used to power homes and uh, you know the key kind of fridges and uh, lights and uh, charging devices, that kind of thing. Um, so that was uh, a positive for you know having that kind of facility available, especially with the likes of the Hyundai Ioniq 5 coming out with vehicle to load technology, where you're gonna be able to both inside and from the charge port have an adapter that will power around three kilowatts um, or so, we'll put it up on the screen here, of um, output, which is uh, decent, you know, and these um, Ford F-150s that uh, can be used as generators were putting out around seven kilowatts. The, the downside of that was there was also an increase in carbon monoxide poisoning cases at that same point as people tried their gasoline vehicles to power things uh, from the, the car. Um, not ideal and obviously that kind of shows the downside and where electric vehicles come into their own with no local emissions You know, we can talk about the global emissions overall But locally in your driveway a garage at the school pickup That's where we really see the electric vehicle start to come into its own and obviously uh, as we start to get to these technologies that the Ionic 5 will have and also uh, Volkswagen talking about putting in vehicle to X, whatever you're talking about, vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, vehicle to load. Um, that standard is built into ISO 15118 in the latest uh, Dash 20 version. So this is, uh, it's all there, you know, the pieces are starting to come together for that to happen as, you know, your car is sat in your driveway being a source of 60, 70 and above kilowatt hours worth of energy storage. And from battery storage, we link through to uh, demand charges and uh, electrical delivery uh, fees, that side of things, uh, primarily because as we, we see at some Electrify America sites and uh, some Tesla sites, uh, battery storage on site with uh, electric vehicle fast charging is used to mitigate what we call demand fees as an electric uh, utility 
charges, there's demand fears, which are significant, you know, spikes in usage. And uh, for a certain high level of power, they really affect DC fast charging because obviously at some sites you're up to 350 kilowatt delivery per station. Although obviously we don't have too many cars using at that level at the moment, but that's what's coming. And these demand fears need to be sorted out because they make the, you know, already quite difficult um, economics of uh, running a fast charging network almost impossible if you're not deep pocketed as something like Electrify America is and mandated to spend the money one way or another. Or, uh, you know, having um, something like Evolve New York, which will be kind of the basis for uh, the video we do on demand fees, because um, they modeled out, you know, a four stall site and how much it will cost to break even. Massachusetts has uh, mandated that um, utilities look at ways to mitigate demand fees or cut them out altogether. It's a policy initiative at the moment to uh, create kind of exploratory groups and suggestions for how, uh, you know, electric vehicle charging can be um, either exempt or, you know, given some kind of uh, offset for these uh, demand fees, which could quite easily cripple uh, an EV charging network if it was, you know, just starting up and really trying to get moving. And hitting everyone's favorite subject, uh, EV charging, specifically EV fast charging. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of activity from Electrify America over the last uh, month or two. It has been stuck around that 560, 570 uh, charging location. But locally, I was happy to see them um, confirm a location up in West Lebanon, New Hampshire, um, which is going to be a site that bridges the gap from these uh, Massachusetts highways, if you like, and then the uh, more populated areas of South New Hampshire to uh, up to Northern Vermont and uh, Burlington and then on to Canada. Um, this has been a dead zone for a long time. There are still plenty of gaps to fill in in the White Mountains. Um, the Green Mountains are a little better with EVgo having a fairly strong presence in Vermont. So this West Lebanon site is right on the border of uh, Vermont, uh, but actually in New Hampshire, and it's going to be a key site for I-91 and I-89 which intersect at that point. We've been up a few times. Now we can actually get, you know, pretty far from Boston on a charge. We'll get closer to Burlington, Vermont and up into the Canadian border area. But uh, it's a nice one for, you know, it's a natural stopping point. It's a place where people going north and north and south up to Canada, down into the lower parts of New England, will certainly uh, be able to stop. It's an interesting case study as well um, in the fact that they actually had a site, uh, much more downtown site uh, in Lebanon itself, which is a town, you know, a little bit further east of uh, this current site that has been selected, but uh, there was a lot of pushback locally. I don't know if it was uh, electrical, you know, concerns having to make the upgrades, how much it was going to cost, whether it would give up too much parking. Whatever the case, they ran into some, you know, local bureaucracy that uh, kicked the site back. And uh, that had got quite far along, but uh, then they've selected this site now, which is going to be at a Walmart. It's in the standard place where there's a Tesla supercharger up there in the same kind of big box stores, strip mall area. Um, so it's kind of a, it'll be interesting to see, you know, these people who were pushing for it in uh, downtown Lebanon are pretty disappointed because you're thinking that, you know, more and more vehicles are electric, more and more uh, potential to bring people into an area where they may not have gone. And now, you know, for our, our travel purposes, we won't be stopping in Lebanon, New Hampshire. We'll be stopping in the West Lebanon stop, probably feeding, you know, more our money to more established large retail chains. And it kind of furthers that disparity between a downtown area and a, uh, the strip malls and the outer out of town stops. And wary of this uh, getting too long, but we'll try and cover some of the other local uh, EV news, then go a bit broader. Uh, Vermont is getting a bunch of uh, Blink chargers. I'm really interested in the Blink network and what they're going to do next. They seem to consistently have a lot of uh, funding and uh, money flowing around them and interest in the network for investment. But I, for the life of me, have barely used them. I have a card with some credit on. I'll maybe try and do an individual charging video soon. But essentially, I really don't run into the network that often, and it seems either broken or cost prohibitive when I do. I never get quite why they're such a big deal when I barely encounter them, but maybe they're uh, something that you guys find more often. Uh, so if you do, let me know in the comments and your experience with Blink charging. And then on to the Rivian Adventure Network. I won't stick on this one too much because we're going to do a full coffee and kilowatts on it and the um, expansion of uh, 
private networks, exclusive networks versus public charging networks. Now, Rivian Adventure Network is now confirmed. By the end of 2023, there will be 600 plus uh, DC fast charging locations, which are exclusive for Rivian owners for the moment. Some speculation over whether that will be, uh, you know, opened up in the long term because they will use the CCS connector standard. But uh, for the moment, it's going to be something that will be used to sell Rivians only. Um, and then they do have a public option, which is the 10,000 plus Rivian Waypoints network, which is level two, predominantly going to be in destination charging areas, as you'd expect. Um, but, you know, the fact that they're public will be interesting to see, you know, how that expands out and whether Rivian sees such big use that they start to look at opening up the uh, adventure network as well for DC fast charging non-Rivian vehicles. And then to close out, uh, possibly the biggest news, saving the best for last, depending on your, uh, you know, persuasion. But uh, the transport bill was unveiled at the uh, end of March, promising 174 billion uh, towards electrification in the U.S. So that is uh, all linked in with the 500,000 charge points by 2030. This is policy now. This is something that has been laid out as uh, an ambition, as part of a wider infrastructure bill, which is obviously, you know, very much in the headlines at the moment. Huge, huge injection of uh, cash and public works projects, of which uh, sustainable energy and electrification is a big part. Um, so again, we haven't got much further past the, uh, you know, we have the number now of 174 billion, but we knew the 500,000 uh, charging stations by 2030 number already. We knew that electric vehicles and overhauling the tax credits uh, was going to be a focus. Um, $7,000 with GM and Tesla back in the loop has been mooted as a... Uh, not a tax credit perhaps now, uh, but maybe money off the hood of uh, electric vehicles, which would certainly get a lot more people, you know, interested, uh, not having to wait for tax time and see what their tax burden is to uh, take advantage of it. So in the transport bill, you know, big, a lot of focus on uh, electrification of fleets, uh, electrifying school buses, um, getting the, uh, the kind of, you know, under the surface stuff ready for better transmission lines, um, a move to clean energy, upgrading the infrastructure as a whole, all stuff which is just, you know, so broad that um, you will really have to wait and see what comes out. So this sets the stage really for this kind of momentum that we uh, felt at the start of the year as we covered in the monthly buzz in January um, to start turning into concrete policy uh, goals and objectives and uh, you know it's too early for really site identification and saying what the strategy will be but it does take that kind of top-down level like we see with the Rivian Adventure Network of saying you know following Tesla's lead and saying this is a strategic network because we want people to buy our electric vehicles it's looking forward 10 years and saying once we get to 2030 where do we need these things to be? Where do we need a charging network in place that we can say, you can buy any electric vehicle and charge it, get across the country in the time it takes, uh, you know, almost a gasoline vehicle to do that. So that's it for uh, a monthly buzz, which was uh, trying to skirt over a bunch of uh, topics this month. So I hope it wasn't too brief in, uh, in any of them. I'll provide lots of uh, further reading and videos down in the description if you want to dive into any particular story. But over to you, really. What are your uh, thoughts on the stories that we presented? Do you think there is this uh, growing momentum towards electrification? Who do you think will come out in the next two or three years on top? Um, who has the hollow promises? Who has the concrete plans and proposals? Um, and where do you want to see charging? Where does EV charging need to focus as a priority area, um, whether it's by location or by type of charging, um, to, to really expand and get that EV adoption hurdle out of the way? Uh, let us know in the comments. As always, I appreciate your patience and uh, for watching. Um, and we look forward to producing many more videos this spring. Lots to come, lots of uh, plans and series. So thanks for bearing with us and we'll have a lot more for you soon. Cheers. Thank you.